Hi, I'm James Kay, and welcome to this session on uh, PR for indie game developers. What I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to take you through um, our top 10 tips um, just as a way of background quickly before I begin. Uh, I'm co-founder of uh, PR agency Big Games Machine. We work with a lot of indie developers on their global launches on multiple platforms, mobile, PC, console, VR. Um, and so having worked on a lot of uh, launches with developers and um, they always like to hear tips from from the people that are dealing with the journalists um, so that's what I'm going to be going to be, going to be doing today um, so without further ado I'll launch straight into the the first slide here um, tip number one is uh, understand the role of of PR in your marketing mix and what I mean by that is that typically a lot of game developers don't always understand the, the function of PR. And what I mean by that is primarily not to view PR as a direct response marketing mechanism. PR is a brand building tool. It's raising awareness of your title in the market so that if people do see a Facebook um, ad, for example, or they're watching an influencer and there's a link below on the video, um, they would have potentially read about your game before or they, they would have felt some hype about it. But PR is effectively a part of the marketing mix. It's an important part of the marketing mix, but it often uh, causes me some concern when developers put 100% um, of their marketing into PR and then try and link it to downloads. That doesn't always, sorry, <clears throat> that doesn't always really happen. Um, that's that. I don't want to start on a negative, um, but I just want to make sure that when you're engaging with a PR agency, or you're engaging with PR, you understand that it is part of a marketing mix and it's not the entire marketing mix. Okay. Tip number two. Um, you can do it yourself. You know, I've, I, I don't pretend that what we do is astonishing magic. Um, there is a lot of what we do from experience that obviously there is a benefit to working with an agency, but developers can, can do it themselves if they want. You can, if you've got the time and you've got the ability. But that good old phrase, you don't know what you don't know, comes to play. And you'll start off with the best of intentions and often find it's more time consuming or you're not getting the results that, that you want. Um just a few things, really. I mean, firstly, uh, if you're looking, you know, as you're looking at the slides, the press do actually like to hear directly from developers. Um, they're very happy to hear from developers, contrary to what you may believe. Um, it's not the PR agencies and the big publishers that have got the ear of the of the of the media. Um, the media do like to uh, hear from you directly, and often very can be very responsive as long as you don't drive them mad. Um, but like I said, it does take a lot of time. Um, and, and if you don't have the relationship there in the first place, you're starting cold, which means you've got to do a really good pitch. And, and we can go over that a bit later on in this session in any case. Um, I, th I think there's, there was a really, really interesting piece um, that was put online by, by this guy, Justin Carroll, um, uh, a few months ago. Um, and I thought it was fantastic because it actually broke down the real cost uh, it says that he called it the realistic guide to pricing indie game marketing. It can give you an idea of what it would cost to do it yourself. And and the way that he did this was that he obviously um, didn't say it's you literally spending money, but he's calculating your time as a value based on several assumptions and, and metrics. But I, you know, I cut the quote out here quote out here because I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, PR or public relations basically means the tedious work of creating a list, building a press kit and then sending hundreds of emails, following up, and doing correspondence. PR takes a full three months to complete and costs about $9,000 to do it yourself. Um, that, that is, that, that's, that's variable, obviously. You know, some people start earlier than three months. Um, some people will start a few months out, depending on what platform the game is, and will have very different pieces of activity. I don't think that's a crazy amount of amount of money. Some people we can charge more or less than that, depending on the scope of work. But I thought it was a good a good guide to put in here, or a guideline for any of you who are trying to work out what you think you should potentially be spending on on PR. Okay, next tip. 
events. Um, now, a few months ago, we did the first ever, we undertook the first ever game reviewer survey. And really, that was because I don't know if anybody's actually asked game reviewers, uh, journalists, what they're looking for. Um, why they respond to to pitches? Why things something's interesting them interest them? Why some things don't interest them? So we undertook this study. It's available on our website at big game www.biggamesmachine.com. It's free to download. It's a report. So what I'm going to be doing is referencing that um, several times during this presentation because it gives you actual empirical data proof. As to, as, to, as to what I'm saying, rather than just working on hearsay and assumptions. So we actually interviewed um, 217 journalists from a wide range of media, global media, um, GameSpot, Polygon, IGN, Kotaku, and the big guys, um, all the way through to, to, to smaller sites. Um, and what was really enlightening for us as well was when we did give those developers the ability, so developers, the journalists, um, the ability to um, freely express themselves or say more, they gave a really we opened the floodgates. So what you're not going to see in this presentation is necessarily all the quotes. There's some sort of short quotes from them. But I think if you do get the report, there's some really interesting things that they are saying about when um, de indie developers, developers are, as a whole, are approaching them. Um, this, this, this point here is events can be great for meeting the media. Um, and what, we've, what we did was we just asked them how important the, these, the following channels were when it came to discovering games for review. Um, and, and just going back to my previous slide, you can see clearly that I have... Um, I've said that, or, or the, the survey said that getting um, approached direct from the developer is actually the top thing that they're, that they're receptive to or they're looking for. Not surprisingly, PR agency pitches are up there as well. But interestingly, down there, um, the third one is events and conferences. And I think it's very good to go to events. And, and if you can arrange meetings with the media and obviously get word out there, there are some cost-effective ways that you can appear um, at events now. There are people like Tentacle Collective um, who are actually buying up space and selling it to indie developers. At GDC, there's now an air, areas dedicated for indie developers. And so there are affordable um, ways, uh, you know, a few thousand dollars, maybe four thousand dollars, depending, um, that you can appear at events. But it, it can be a very valuable way for you to arrange meetings with the media and you can often access the media list uh, and approach the media directly. Um, <laughs> the next one is that PR can't help a crappy Me Too game. Sorry for my bad language. Um, but no amount of PR, no great PR agency can, can help a game that's mediocre. And I know that sounds really obvious. It's like you're hitting your head now and you're going, really? Tell me something I didn't know. But you'll be amazed how many indie developers we work with are not bouncing, you know, unless you're in early access, of course, and that's a given on PC. Unless you're in early access, you're in, in sort of Google Play Alpha for a mobile, a beta for a mobile game. Um, you're not necessarily getting the unbiased feedback from people that you need to be getting. So I've met more than enough developers who seem to be operating in a vacuum and that's why we give a lot of the help and advice but quality is everything you know the number one thing that will shine through is the quality of your game and your ability to demonstrate why it deserves to be purchased why it, dem why it deserves to be in the market and once again these all sound like obvious things but in all the years we've been doing this it, it, it's not as prevalent as as i would like it to be as a philosophy um, and that's why we said here to get as much feedback as you can um, and also, we'll go on to this in a minute with the pitching, but really understanding who your competitors are is very, very, very important. Understand who your competitors are and then be able to say succinctly and clearly why you feel your game is better than or different than or worth a look over and above another game that a journalist may be familiar with. Because when you're dealing with journalists, you're de you have to assume they're going to have an encyclopedic knowledge of 
of, of, of the games industry, but more often than not, you're going to be dealing with someone who has a particular interest in the area, a racing game, an RPG. The, the game, your game will be given to the, a freelancer or a person who may have a particular interest in your genre, and they will benchmark you against the other games that they've spent many hours playing. Um, so I think that's very important that you come at this. Um, you definitely need to come at this from, from that perspective or that assumption. Okay, next one is getting your timing right. And timing's a really, really interesting interesting point here. F first thing is do not leave things till the last minute. Once again, um, I cannot begin to tell you how many um, developers approach us a week, two weeks before launch. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. There's just, there's nothing we can do. Can't do anything. Um, so we have to kind of reject things, unfortunately, if we don't have enough time. Um, I, I'll go over the timings as well um, in a bit and when journalists are looking to review games. But generally speaking, you need to have a multi-staged approach to your campaign. So obviously, if you're launching on PC, um, there, there's a few potential phases there. So you're going to have your, if you're going to go on early access, you're typically looking at uh, maybe an announcement the game exists and that it's going to be in early access in the next couple of months. And so that's phase one, just saying, hey, this is my game, isn't it cool? Take a look. This is going to be coming to early access soon. Then you've got your early access launch. Um, and for early access, you're going to almost be treating it like a, we treat it almost like a, a launch, a review stage, because you want to say to people, hey, it's on early access now. People can go and get it, they can buy it, they can they can play your game. Um, and we offer the code, or we actually proactively give keys, Steam keys, to quite a large amount of media. So they that cuts out a stage. So they we've given the key, they sometimes feel obliged to play it. Or just simply it takes the, the friction out of the process because you know that they're more likely to try it. Um, then you've got your, um, and this is really early access we're talking about here, by the way. I'll, I can talk about mobile in a minute and console. Um, then uh, during early access, you might put out a couple of updates about new features, characters, levels, whatever. Um, and then generally speaking, you've got your launch phase when you're going to be leaving early access, probably a good few months later, for some people years later. Um, and you're going to once again treat it almost the same as when you're going to early access, and you're going to get try and get people to review the game. When you're looking at mobile, I think you're dealing with much more truncated timeframes. I think you're probably dealing with a six to eight week window. Um, typically speaking, that's announcing the game is coming on iOS or Android um, in the next few weeks and then trying to get it reviewed. Console as well um, doesn't tend to have the early access phase or that beta testing phase um, or that testing phase. So once again, it's not a million miles away from how we would approach mobile. You're announcing the game um, and then you're trying to get, um, you. If, if they've got dev kits, then you can be offering uh, code to people to, to try the game, obviously, um, ahead of launch in, in the interim. And then really at launch, you're trying to give codes to people um, so that they can, they, can, they can play your game and they can review it. In terms of time frames as well, timings, you know, obviously you've got to look at during the year. It's really important when you think about the year, what's happening at that point in time. So, for example, the, the year has, has got a very busy games calendar and there's going to be what are called tent pole events. And, and typically they're going to be probably GDC Game Developer Conference um, at the beginning of the year in March, where there's going to be a lot of media there. So to your advantage, you can go there to meet them. But if you're trying to launch a game around then or any of these events, the media is going to be swamped. They're going to be swamped in the two weeks before then by people trying to arrange meetings they're going to be swamped the week they're there and then they're going to spend time after the event or even two weeks writing it up so it's not generally advisable to try and launch your game um, around these shows unless you're aiming to meet them there and give them a one-to-one -one briefing a demo of your game and that pretty much stands for, for something like e3 as well which is you normally about june gamescom in europe is a significant event but those are kind of your, your main events and then obviously there's your times of year so the busiest times of year in the game retail calendar tend to be towards the end of the year as well once again you're going to probably know this thanksgiving is your big spike a lot of people put games on sale around thanksgiving a lot of uh, launches people clamoring for attention and then the big christmas rush uh, it a lot of people want to launch at Christmas. If you're a small indie, I tend to advise against it. 
Um, I just feel that you're fighting an, a, a losing battle and you're going up against the big boys or big girls. Um, and so I'm doing myself out of work typically towards the end of the year. I'm not a fan of launching towards the end of the year, November, December, even getting into October, because for the reviews to appear in November for when the games are on the shelves, the review, the, they've got to be reviewing the games in October in order to play them and then be able to write up their you know, write up their review. So, and then the summer, summer's a really interesting one. Like in Europe, a lot of Europe's just shut down in August. People are away on vacation. I know in the US, obviously, kids go back to school late August. There's two schools of thought, really, on the summer period, July and August. Um, school of thought one is, oh, you know, there's actually less games. It's my chance to, to, to actually grab a slot and people might be, could be interested. You know, the, the editor's the journalist could be interested. Um, but the risk you run is that consumers aren't there as much and not looking as much. They're on vacation. Then again, with more people sitting by the pool today looking at their iPads, their phones or whatever. But obviously for PC, people are not going to be sitting there on their PCs browsing the you know the, the Steam store um, or Humble Bundle or whatever it, wherever it is that you that you, your game's going to be visible. So you, these are all things you just need to bear in mind where an agency can tend to give give you assistance in in the in the timings of your game. And the next point is giving the media enough time to review, write, and schedule in, the, in your game. It's really important. You know, a good example. We launched a game on the 12th of April, which was a couple of months ago. And we offered that game. It was a very deep RPG. We offered it for review four weeks beforehand. Yeah? And generally speaking, I'll show you in a minute, the average game you need to offer about three weeks ahead. We offered it out because it was a 50-hour RPG at four weeks beforehand to give the journalists enough time to play the game write their review, and then we place it on what's called under embargo, if you're not familiar with that phrase, which means the journalists agree to honour um, that date to say for you to say, please don't publish your review until the day it launches, which is why you magically get all the reviews appearing on a specific day, because the media are under embargo. Um, you, you, that game we did four weeks um, under embargo to launch on April the 12th, so we offered it out, I know, March the 12th for argument's sake. A lot of people wrote their reviews and published and agreed to embargo and launched on that date. But even now, when I'm recording this in the middle of May, we are still seeing reviews appearing a month later. So you just have to bear in mind, journalists are extremely busy. So the, the, the size of your game is a factor. If you've got a hugely complex game, it's going to take more time for them to play through. They've got a lot of stuff that they're trying to look at at the same time. Um, once they've played through your game, they're going to have to write up their review, and then it has to actually be scheduled into the editorial calendar. It's not like everything's written, it just gets published that day. They have to find an appropriate place, hopefully the launch day, um, when the review appears. But you need to factor in a decent amount of time for all of that to happen. Um, and then the last point is really what I was talking about before is to cease your obsession with launching at, at Christmas or the holidays, as you call it in the US, Thanksgiving and just cra crazy times, cra crazy times of year. Um, just just to back up what I, I'm saying here, this is the question we ask the media is how long before a game launch do you like to be offered a build for review? And you can see that roughly almost 60 percent there said three weeks so we as a rule of thumb we tend to use three weeks you can see two weeks or less was about 30 percent but i would always work on the basis of your build now bear in mind that if you are on um mobile your game has to be offered to the media mobile's different it's usually about two weeks what we do on mobile is we offer a game to the media about two weeks ahead of launch however that game has to be on the App Store and live so you can generate keys, but hidden from public view. Which means, realistically, I know the App Store submissions have become much shorter in recent months and they can turn it around in a few days. But you, if you're working your way back from a review appearing on mobile, you need to go back two weeks to, to offering it to the media for review and to play and to write it up, as I've said, under embargo. And probably at least another week before that for submission or even two weeks if you want to be be really conservative um, for submission and approval, assuming it doesn't get rejected and just gets put up there. And so that's just a good guideline for when you're submitting your game to the, your mobile game for the media. That's on iOS, obviously. With Android, it's a different system. There's no keys. Um, unfortunately, the best that we can do at the moment is, is offer direct APK file downloads, which a lot of people I understand are uncomfortable with, especially 
if it's a premium game. Um, if you're a, uh, a free-to-play game, then it's not so much a problem um, as well. But these are all things to, to bear in mind. Um, next point, I think, is possibly one of the most important ones in this presentation. And it's that journalists want to feel special, not because they're insecure and they want to have lots of love and appreciation and their massive egos. It's because they want to feel that you understand them, that you're targeting them and you're giving them uh, games that are going to be or that are relevant to their interests. I myself, weirdly enough, we as a PR agency, people mistake us for editorial for some weird reason I don't really understand. Um, but I've received some terrible, terrible, terrible generic emails where people just spam the um, press release in there and don't just don't even there's no intro text there's no summary of the points there's nothing so I think the most important thing that you can do is it's better to do a very small amount of journalists than hundreds okay and what you need to do is first of all is say right these are the 20 30 sites that I would like to be on that I aspire to be on then probably what you're going to do is say who are my direct competitors Find out who your direct competitors are and then quite simply say, who is the journalist that has played my competitors' games? Once you've identified that person, then you can either try and get their email direct using something like hunter.io. Hunter.io is a very good tool. Um, it gives you generally can help you find email addresses um, at, a, at a company. Um, I've, we've used it a few times ourselves. Um, or you can even tweet journalists. Some journalists are quite amenable to you direct messaging them or tweeting them saying, hey, I see you've played this game. Our game's coming soon. We'd love you to check it out. Um, talk to them normally, not in terrible, terrible hyperbole, the best, the world leading, earth shattering, best thing since sliced bread, life changing game. Be very on the level. They've seen it and heard it all before. They're going to be naturally cynical as well. Don't fill your pitch or your approach with lots of... It's just annoying language, basically, and, and, and it gets their backs up. So don't spam them as part of a mass mailing as number one. Don't get 700 addresses or buy a list and spam out the same message. Doesn't work, okay? Identify the interest and pitch accordingly. Make it personalised. Say, hey, I see... I really liked your preview of this game. I thought you might take a look at my game, here's the key for you to check it out. The more you demonstrate to them their interests or something you saw them talking about recently, that that's an immediate indicator that you've actually, um, you've actually siphoned them off, you've actually identified them out of all, all of the mass. Make sure the game fits their audience and readership. Do not pitch a PC game to someone who covers mobile, do not uh, pitch a casual game to a company that specialises in strategy games. It may sound obvious, but believe me, it happens a lot more than you think. Speak to them like people, is what I said. Just don't pepper it with crap, annoying language. Um, just talk to them normally. Um, and then they love getting early builds and news. Um, you know, they if you say, I'd like to give you early access, special preview, anything like that, that helps them feel special. That's why generally, if people come to us with games that have already launched, it's a massive problem because essentially that feeling of being special isn't there, there with journalists. You'll, if you go to journalists and say, look, this game's been out on Steam for a month, two months, you may not have tried it, do you want to check it out? Chances are their their brain's going to go. Why didn't you come to me earlier? Why didn't you bother? And you're kind of killing your chances. So unfortunately, it's uh, it's closing the the you know the stable door after the horse has bolted on on that one. I, that's why we recommend starting as early as possible in the in the whole um, the whole time frame of PRing your game, no matter what what format you're on. And and most of you watching this will know that, but we have to we have to say these things. Um, this is a really interesting slide here. Um, we ask the journalists, select the reasons why you are likely to reject or ignore a review request. And you can see the top answers here. Top one, game looks bad, game looks poor. Normally you would send a video of your game. That's the easiest thing to do to a journalist is not, not just sending screenshots, you send a trailer. They're gonna have a gut, a gut feeling, a gut reaction to it. If it doesn't look good, it's not polished, it just doesn't spark their interest, that's an immediate judgment call they're going to make. And they don't always get it right, but they've got a good good intuition. Um, unfortunately, the biggest reason here is the game is for a platform that the journalists don't cover. And it's what I, what I just said. That so many of these journalists will get 
males. You know, obviously Kotaku, Polygon, IGN are generic GameSpot. They're general interest sites. They're going to cover multiple formats. But there are many, many, many sites out there that are specialist, you know, specialised just in PC, just in PS4, just Xbox One, mobile, and people often send games to them for a completely different platform. It happens a lot, and you can see that's the biggest reason. Um, and that was classed as very important. Um, the third reason is not appropriate for your readership audience. And once again, it's kind of similar, but it's to do with targeting. Uh, and then the next one there is also a poorly written pitch. And really that goes back to what I said, is either spamming, writing a press release, filling it with terrible overinflated language and not just talking to them on the level, or you don't, you're not demonstrating your ability to concisely say in a few bullet points, Hi, I'd like you, I think you, I saw you reviewed this game, or I know you're interested in this kind of game. I think you really like my game. I'm working on what we're working on for the following reasons. And then four quick reasons. It's, uh, we, we are the team behind this game. Your pedigree as a developer can count for a lot, by the way. Um, any success that you've had, you should always be pushing that out. That's a really big thing. Um, it's developed by a team that's had a uh, sales success of over 20 million copies, 10 million copies, whatever it is. I'm working on another mobile game now um, where their previous title had six and a half million downloads. So I'm going to, we are going to be using that in our pitch with the media because it gives them credibility. Um, you know, or your veterans of having worked on certain licenses or certain franchises. Um, the uh, the you know the other things in the pitch is going to be key features. You know uh, the, this other game we worked on called Tower of Time is an example. Um, it's a fifty hour RPG that in of itself sort of a throwback to Baldur's Gate we played on a lot, but it's got a a, a slow down mechanism in there for the time. So it's got real time combat, but you can freeze it. And so we came up with something uh, called Arrow Time because if you know you're going to be familiar with bullet time in games like Max Payne, movies like The Matrix, where time seems to magically slow down. And so we um, came up with Arrow Time because it fitted the RPG format. And so that caught on a lot with the journalists. And that was a really key feature, you know, the Arrow Time combat system. So you're looking for these little hooks that can really draw the media in. You know, whether you're using a, a new sound feature, we've got another game work on a VR um, futuristic tennis style game and they've used a special um, the NX audio engine which is kind of surround sound audio so that's another interesting hook there's lots of ways but that's why working with your PR agency is often good because there's things or hooks or level, things of interest that you may not know um, appeal to a journalist but you can often just bring them out your bring them out yourself okay um, next point tip seven keep your pitch clear and concise so this I've, I've covered a lot of this already um, so I don't want to go over it again too much, but just state why your game is worth looking at. And that's the USPs, the unique selling points. You know, like I said, that's about you. That's about uh, it's got, you know, a million procedurally, you know, it's got procedurally generated levels, endless replayability, um, online play for up to 50,000 simultaneous users, um, developed by a team of three. I've got another game we're working on was developed by two people. A lot of time, the size of your technical achievement is is can be disproportionate to the size of your team in a positive way. So if you're very small developers, that can often work a lot in your favor. And sometimes it's just packed with features. You've got, you know the stuff that, this is all the stuff you sat down with a piece of paper and said, right, this is the market, this is what's out there, this is why our stuff's going to be better or more interesting and you're just going to take that and that's what you're putting across to the journalists to get their attention and um, once again you'll want to see if they've covered similar games hi so and so i see you've covered this game and this game i thought you might interested in, be interested in my game because it is also similar um, once again your pedigree hugely important we've discussed that already um, include high quality assets. Normally we have a, uh, a, dro a Dropbox, we use Google Drive. Um, create a folder in there just with a, you can put the video on YouTube. Um, you can hide the video or you can make it public. Just bear in mind that if you're making it public, you're not making them feel special again. So you might put it on a private link so that they can share it out, but or, or at a certain date, but it's up to you really. It's not a major problem, but just if it's on a public link and it's got 20,000 views, they're not gonna feel like they're one of the first people seeing the video. Um, really nice screenshots obviously say a lot um, some game art some concept art and maybe you know the logo the icon character artwork and stuff like that um, and then offering steam keys or promo codes really important if you can proactively just paste a steam key or a promo code into the, at least the top 20 journalists you're taking a layer you're reducing the friction in the process and you they don't have to email you back and then you'll message it back and they may not see your message you're just removing that that 
that stumbling block at that point, um, which is very useful to do. Um, just another another stat from the survey. How important are the following factors when deciding whether to review a game? So we, we asked the media what, what are the things they take into consideration. You can see that actually it's sort of fairly equal. There's nothing, you know, the standout thing, I suppose, is that the game once again is being a good fit for their audience and their readership. And that's to do with genre of game, strategy, uh, FPS, whatever it is, um, versus um, just being on the right the right platform. You know, the other major reasons are there were the, the, the person gave a lot of assets, and it's what I've spoken about just now. Once again, the game code was included. That's very important. Um, and that once again, it's this targeting thing, that the pitch was written with the journalists and their own specific interests in mind. Really, really, really important. But I'm I don't want to sound like a stuck record, but you can see a very clear pattern forming here of being direct, um, specific and focused and relevant to that journalist and appealing to them. And if you do those things, you the, the battle is won over and above. Other people are just sending them terrible, spammy rubbish. Um, you know, there's other factors here that are important from a developer, a publisher they trust, a PR agency. But really, you can see those are the, the, the main reasons. Uh, tip number eight is, is do not drive the journalist nuts. It's a fine line between enthusiasm and, and diligence and checking and just pissing them off, basically. Um, you know, the, the, the media, the, the, the survey that we did showed the, how many uh, requests a day journalists receive. Certainly on the mobile front, some journalists can be receiving 10, 20 requests a day for, for review. It's high. It's a lot. You can you can see it in the survey. Um, so you, you've got to generally what we do is we send them um, an email normally we would email them at the time of day earlier in their day so we know it's going to be at the top of their inbox that's another thing so if they're in the west coast of the US you need to factor that in if you're in Europe um, if they're in Europe you've got to factor it in if you're in the US but just you know it's got a bigger better chance of being seen you know 10 a.m their time for example um, don't don't usually do it on a Monday morning um, and then leave it for a bit. Now, we, we it's very, very, very common they won't see your email. Really common. Like, stuff will slide down the inbox. We've got lots of games where we may have had to reach out two or three times, and they'll come back a third time, and they'll say, I'm really sorry, I just missed it the first time, whatever. So if you leave it a few days between checking in, I think that's okay. If you just say, hi there, I sent you an email a few days ago about a game. You might like to look at it. May have you may have missed it. Here it is again. It's okay if you do it three, four times, and you're driving them nuts. If you do at least one follow up, I think that's fine. I think that that's that's probably enough. Do not spam them on Twitter. Do not keep sending them emails every day. If they say they're going to review your game, do not message them every day when the review is going to appear. You need to just leave them to it. The the problem you're going to have is journalists are not always communicative. They might ask for a key, um, but they may actually decide not to. They may play inside, they don't like the look of it, but they're not going to write back to you and say, hey, I didn't like it for these reasons. They're very unlikely to write back to you and say, I'm not going to do this. Um, if they're interested, they will ask for something, but there's an element of this where you're going to have to leave it in the lap of the gods. You cannot always gauge where they are at in the process. Many journalists, the majority are very decent and will say, yeah, I'm going to write a review. Uh, I'm going to hopefully publish it on the embargo date and they'll even publish the review and then they will message us straight after when they've done it and say hey I'd like you to know we've posted your review and they will often do that as a courtesy but you just need to bear that in mind um, if you don't hear back like I said it means they're not interested so you need to take the hint um, and you're not going to get qualitative feedback from them you just it's not going to happen um, in fact at the bottom here we've actually said how many review requests a day they receive? Sorry, I hadn't looked. I should know my own slides, but I, I forgot that they were there at the bottom. So, so by and large, the majority receive between one and ten a day. Um, I, I, once again, the, the, that's not even working days because because developers are sending requests on a weekend as well. I mean, even worst case scenario, they're receiving 50, 50 a week. That's two hundred requests a month. Um, that that that's a lot. It's over two thousand requests for review a year, and that's at the lower end of the scale. You know, you can see here, twenty percent get between ten and twenty, and six percent get twenty a day. So it's really, really a very hard, harsh world out there, unfortunately. Um, tip number nine is use creativity to get to get noticed. You know, we we've done a few things which 
um, have endeared us to the media um, haven't been expensive. We worked on a game called Dear Leader, which is about um, a parody of Kim Jong-un uh, in North Korea. And the developer, um, we, we gave him the idea. And um, firstly, we sent an email out to the media in the style of um, the envoy for Kim Jong-un uh, and wrote it in that kind of broken English and made it very humorous. Um, and journalists really liked it to the point where actually my colleague was at Nordic Game Conference with a journalist giving a talk like this to loads of game developers. And he cited that email he received um, as being different and quirky and didn't know my colleague who sent it to him was in the room. So my colleague went up afterwards and introduced himself. It was a happy coincidence. But what we did afterwards, we actually, you can go to our website and see this case study. Um, you, you can actually click on it and look at the photos. And we wrote, uh, we spent a lot of time that we wrote, we bought some specially selected paper um, we wrote it like a typewritten message, inviting the journalists to visit uh, People's Republic of North Korea. We bought a rubber stamp um, that we had made, uh, had one that had top secret on it that you could see on the envelope. And then we bought actually had a rubber stamp made of the emblem of the people, you know, Workers' Republic of North Korea. So it looked like it came from there. On the envelope, you can actually see on the, on the screen that there's stamps on there. I sourced North Korean used stamps from a stamp dealer in the UK that we then put on these envelopes. So we sent these really authentic yellow kind of high quality paper envelopes with a typewritten letter. And once again, if you go to our site, you can read the entire um, letter that we, that, we, that we wrote from the envoy. And then we put it in a pack with some Donald Trump toilet paper um, to be provocative. Um, and we sent that to to about 20 journalists uh, and, and it obviously got, you know, people liked it and we got good responses and, and that wasn't expensive. There was another project we worked on with a, a game, a mobile game, which is like an escape room type game set a um, hundred years ago or, or the turn of the century um, with an English explorer who goes into the jungles of Cambodia to find this mystical city and he's sending back uh, we we got a voice art. We scripted and we managed a session with a voice artist um, to actually send. We sent one message personalized to twenty journalists, actually with their name, my dear Andrew, my dear Sarah, my dear James. It started, um, and then him speaking for a minute about how he's found these temples and it's amazing, and he's going to go and explore more, and he's going to send another update in a couple of days. Um, and then for the rest of the media, we did a more generic message, my dear friend. We put, um, and then about three days later, we sent a follow up message from my colleague Theo, um, who was in character saying, um, I'm sorry if you're reading this. Uh, the, the message was basically from the, the explorer again saying, I'm really sorry if you're hearing this message. Something terrible's happened to me. I sent my manservant Theo, so we name check Theo in the recording who sent the email um, to enlist you as the world's greatest detective to come and help find me. So we were creating a sense of a mystique and we were personalizing for the media. And then we were drawing the media in to get them to download the game and play it to try and find this explorer that had gone missing. And that was a video recording session with a voice artist. It was not an enormous amount of work to script something for 30 seconds to get it recorded and then to send out digital recordings to everyone, to, to the media. And it was very effective. And once again, if you go on a website, it's called Escape Hunt, the, Escape Hunt, the Lost Temp Temples, the case study. And I've actually put, I've embedded the SoundCloud recordings on there so you can clearly hear what we sent to the media. Um, number 10, the last one, influencers. I think you're probably sitting there now thinking, hmm, he's really conspicuous in the absence of talking about in influencers. And when we're talking about influencers, I think we're by and large really talking about Twitch and we're talking about uh, obviously YouTube. Uh, I, I, obviously you're all, everyone's obsessed with streamers, uh, influencers. They are, very, they are very influential. You know, they drive a huge amount of interest. Uh, a game I worked on recently got picked up by some massive influence that had millions of followers and it's had an amazing, amazing effect on them. Uh, to the point where some people are going for inf influencers at the expense of PR, but I think it's part of PR, but it's also complementary. I think the grey area for influencers is when it transitions from earned media to paid media. Um, and what I mean by that is that the lower mid to long tail of the influencers, typically you're people with, with less following, but they're, they're trying to make a name for themselves. And by merit, they will cover your title because it's interesting to them. Once you get to the mega, mega high end where they've got millions of followers, you know, either they're very specific, you know, like Ali A only really plays Fortnite. So you're not going to target someone at Ali A. PewDiePie is going to be the obvious one that everyone cites. You know, he's more of a generalist, but he likes crazy stuff. When you get into those upper echelons, 
it's largely going to be paid for stuff, um, but some of it earned. So I'm by no means saying that you don't approach the mega big people. Uh, I'm just saying there's going to be a point where you're going to have to sh start shelling out big bucks realistically to get covered by the bigger people. And so your chance, a better chance may be with the, the medium to long tail. Um, and once again, you can approach them directly. Um, the way we work with influencers efficiently is we use we, we use a service called Keymailer. Keymailer is is for uh, console and for PC, and you can upload your codes, and it's got million four about four hundred thousand. I don't work for them, by the way, just so you don't think I'm plugging them. Um, there's there's about four hundred thousand influence on there. You can actually go through. Um, you can put your game up there. Um, we we run campaigns for people on on the carousel. You can buy a carousel slot on there to promote your game. The influencers will go on see it and request a key from you. Um, or we've got a feature as a PR agency that other people won't have, and which is why we do run these campaigns for people, which is called Find Gamers on there. And we actually can proactively go in and look for people who've covered games that's similar to yours, and we can then approach them with a key. And much like I've spoken to you about the pitching earlier, say, hey, we saw you've played this game. Would you like to try this game? And that's that's been very successful. And so something like Keymailer can take a lot of the trouble out of approaching YouTubers rather than manually trawling through YouTube and finding people. But you can do that as well. You can do that as well. Um, influencers tend to work on shorter time frames. You know, they're not like the media where they have to write a review. They're often in a race to get to generate coverage, to get coverage. So they may only need a few days rather than a few weeks. Um, a lot of people have got managers now, like I said, and also there's a lot of agencies out there, um, like Matchmade, Matchmade is a specialist agency um, that I know pretty well, and they just do gamer campaigns for for, for influencers. Um, so there are agencies out there that are even specialising in um, working with game developers, but you will have to pay. You know that is a paid for activity. If you've got a budget for, to do PR, it might be you say, well, I'm going to spend some money on PR. I'm going to spend some money on. Facebook advertising and some site skins, taking over some site skins, and you're also going to put some money into influencer relations. And then, you know, influencers have to declare that a slot is sponsored and that they'll often put a direct link to get your game at the, at the bottom of the screen so you can gauge, you know, eyeballs and click throughs as well. And I've already spoken about key mailer as well. And so that's it. We've reached the end of the presentation. I want to really thank you for joining me today. I hope you found it useful. Um, just a couple of final things really. You can see my email, email address on the screen. If you would like to get in touch with me for any reason afterwards to clarify something, to explain something more, absolutely feel free. I'm more than happy um, to continue giving you some help and advice. If you do visit our website at biggamesmachine.com, you'll find the journalist survey that I've referenced today. Um, and you can really take time to read that in more detail and see some of the comments that we were given. And also a blog post um, should have some useful information for you, um, such as how to build a community. Um, and also there's a very long post on there about the timings around launching your games. And that's it. So thank you very much. Um, and I really wish you uh, a very good rest of conference. Bye.